good afternoon on behalf of the president and the council of the gold medical association it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all for this lecture today organized by the gold medical association uh, so we are going to uh, witness uh, i think it's a very timely uh, lecture uh, it is my great pleasure and i consider it as a privilege to introduce professor suranjit uh, seniviratna uh, the who is the presenter today professor suranjit seniviratna is not a uh, stranger to sri lankan audience and he is a very good friend of many colleges in sri lanka uh, uh, professor suranjit seniviratna had a brilliant academic career at the and obtained his mbbs degree from the faculty of medicine colombo with first class honors having placed first in that year he obtained eight distinctions and 10 gold medals in the medical school professor suranjit seniviratna is currently the consultant in clinical immunology and transplantation at royal free hospital and university college london uh, center for immunodeficiency london united kingdom So it is my great pleasure in inviting Professor Suranjit Seniviratna to present this lecture on COVID-19 vaccines uh, and immune aspects. Over to Professor Suranjit Seniviratna. It is your time now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kalum, for the introduction, kind introduction, and thanks a lot to the Gaul Medical Association for asking me to do this talk and giving me the opportunity to. Uh, Uh, to indicate some aspects of uh, uh, some aspects of uh, the covid vaccine and the immune response so what i'll do in this quick uh, update is i'll the this uh, the areas that i will touch up quickly go through basic aspects and i'll put in the new variant sars cov2 a bit higher up because that's a topical the uh, topic at the moment with the uk having a lot of uh, number of cases of the variant and lots of people asking questions about uh, vaccines etc then i'll talk about the immune changes and the antibody and cellular response and co the covid-19 vaccines which again have been rolled out uh, the two vaccines have been rolled out and have been used uh, in the world so if we uh, if we uh, look at the basics first if i just go back to the basics you have the original pluripotent cell which will produce different types of cells white cells and the neutrophils and lymphocytes and there are different types of lymphocytes that are there including b cells and t cells now b cells will produce antibodies t cells will talk to each other and other cells using uh, uh, that uh, chemicals called cytokines so that is these are the different types of t cells there are different i won't go into too much detail but there are th1 cells th2 cells uh, t regulatory cells etc which are important in a immune response so the vaccine you expect the vaccine to produce these different cells that would have memory the important thing is to have memory like us in memory our own memory the vaccine will produce memory so that when a person has an infection in the future that memory will come into action and that like all of us have different types of memory the vaccine also can produce different types of memory in people so then this shows a schematic of the interaction between a cell called the antigen presenting cell that is the one that recognizes the virus or the bacteria at the start and interacting closely with the t cell which produces the cytokines and the b cells which become plasma cells and produce the immunoglobulins so those are the two cells that you want uh, the the vaccine to uh, uh, to uh, stimulate and produce their responses now from the end of last year beginning of this year we know that sars cov2 has taken over a lot of people's talk activities life etc and this was first uh, described if one knows in wuhan and they they found that it was more related to sars cov1 which is at the top of the figure as opposed to mers which is at the low end of the figure 
and it was closely associated with the bat coronavirus. So this has been investigated over a period of time, over 12 months, to look at the different correlates, the immune correlates, etc. Now, we know that the virus has a number of projects on the surface called spike proteins. And, in the, and that it acts as a trimer, that is three uh, come together and form the three, uh, uh, there's a trimer pro, trimer, trimeric spike protein on the surface. And if I show you the next uh, uh, slide, you can see that on the surface you have the trimeric protein, but that is not the only protein in the virus. There are other proteins, there's envelope, there's uh, membrane, there's nuclear capsid, and the mRNA, which is the important genetic element. So there is MR, it's, and, and then RNA, sorry, RNA virus, the, the RNA virus, which is the, it's a type of RNA virus. And then you have the nuclear capsid, you have the membrane, you have the envelope and the spike protein. So the importance of knowing that is because the present vaccines are directed against the spike protein and the, the later development of vaccines, the expectation is that the vaccine will also be uh, made to the other proteins and it will be a more broad immune response as opposed to only a spike where they had to move very fast and produce a vaccine against spike protein, but in most of the vaccines. So number of proteins in the, in the virus. And this is the gene structure of the different, of the different, uh, uh, the virus of the SARS-CoV-2 that we are dealing with, which causes COVID, SARS-CoV-1, and MERS. And you can see that there is this domain structure. And in the uh, pink, you have the spike protein. That is the area that produces the spike protein. So the gen genetic element that produces the uh, spike protein. So normally you have DNA, RNA, protein. So that's the important thing from the RNA that you get, uh, ultimately you get the protein. And those are very quite similar structures that are there, but there are differences. So the important thing to remember here is that you have a lot of protein. You have non-structural proteins and structural proteins. That's an important thing that one must remember. It is not only the spike protein, but it's a combination of proteins that makes up the virus. Uh, and the virus goes into the cell and then it replicates and produces more viral elements. So if you look at the spike protein, this is a diagram, so the top structure, because that is the most important aspect, especially with the new variant, et cetera, that is coming in. Again, you have different components. And if you look at the component in sort of orangey or sort of yellowish orange, is RBD, the risk receptor binding domain. That is an extremely important domain, the receptor binding domain, uh, because you want that part of it to be, uh, the, the, a lot of the vaccines are directed making antibodies against that component, the receptor binding domain. And that is the component that binds to the ACE2 receptor that is found on the cell. So you have the ACE2 receptor that is found in this figure, can see the virus binding using spike protein. There's a furin protease process going on, which I won't go into detail. And the receptor and virus gets internalized into the cell. Now, the important thing on the right-hand side of the figure, you can find that there is the ACE1. And that part, if it's overactivated, can produce quite a few actions like fibrosis, adverse myocardial remodeling. That is one reason we give ACE inhibitors to patients with hypertension, et cetera. So the initial part of it was, could this be a problem giving ACE inhibitors? But over the period of time, it was found that giving ACE inhibitors to patients, or patients taking ACE inhibitors were not having more severe disease or getting it more frequently. So therefore, we can use ACE inhibitors in this patient. We don't have to stop that drug. So the spike protein with the RBD, the receptor binding domain, binds to the ACE2 protein on the surface of different cells in the lung, in the gut, in the kidney, in the heart, etc., to be internalized, and then it undergoes its process of replication. 
much. That is a quick run through the virus, just so that you would know what I'm talking about when I talk about different immune responses and different vaccine responses, etc. Now, I brought this second topic quite higher up because of this new variant, SARS-CoV-2. Now, an important thing to remember is viruses do mutate when they multiply the positive strand, negative strand neg becomes a positive strand. When it replicates, it will have mutation. This is a figure showing the number of mutation rate. The mutation rate is in the y-axis and the different types of uh, organisms, the viroids, the RNA viruses, DNA viruses, bacteria, and the mutation rate is quite high in RNA viruses. You can see it is it goes up, it's quite high. So mu viruses do mutate, but the important aspect is, are those mutations clinically relevant? And that's the important aspect. It's not that viruses should not mutate. HIV virus mutates very rapidly, and that is why vaccination has been a problem. Influenza virus mutates more rapidly than the SARS-CoV-2 virus, while some other viruses don't mutate often, so as often as the sort of HIV. So that is important to remember. Now, the potential effects of the mutations are five. Those are five. Can it affect the spread of the virus? That's the first thing. Now, we know the D614G mutation, which we knew uh, around the world from about February, March, it would spread around the world and became very, so it increased. We know that it increased the spread. That is an old mutation. I mean, uh, mutation pr producing a variant. So that is an old mutation, which we know quite a lot about. So five things, spread, can it cause more severe disease or is it more mild disease like what we saw in Singapore where it became, uh, there was a change that made it more mild, but that has disappeared. Can it affect diagnostic tests? Can it affect therapeutic agents? And can it affect the vaccine? So that is basically what we would look when a change occurs in the mutation occurs and produces a variant. So the mutation occurs, the protein can change and the structure can change a lot. So again, it's spread. Is it severe disease? Diagnostic test, can it affect the diagnosis element? Therapeutic agent, monoclonal antibody, and can it affect the vaccine, which is a topical question that people are asking. Now, we know that in the UK, you can see this, this is from September to December. Concentrate on the left-hand slide. You had the cases going up. All In all England, the cases going up. Then the lockdown came. The cases came down. But after, towards the end of the lockdown, after lockdown, you can see in the tier four, tier four uh, sort of uh, graph that is put here, it has a massive rise and the government had to move in to produce something called tier four, which we won't go into detail. There was a massive rise in number of cases in London and the Southeast of England. And when they sequence, now what important thing to remember is in the UK, they do a lot of sequencing you know, of the viruses up to 140,000 viruses have been sequenced so far. So if you sequence, you're going to detect these changes. If you don't sequence, you're not going to detect. That is just directly something that comes uh, up. Uh, so this, they found that there was a B117. Different names have been given. I, I'll tell you the other names also. There was a, there were a number of mutations that were found in the spike protein producing this variant. And this is the variant that had been shown at the bottom of the slide in the spike protein. And they are, so if I show you the next slide, B117, you can find that an important change was the N501Y. That was an important change. And another important change was P681H. So the, this N501Y was in the receptor binding domain, the one that I told you before. It was in the receptor binding domain. So that is why it's People are wondering whether it's quite important clinically and that investigation are going. From South Africa, a different uh, variant was described, again, with one of the changes was this N501Y. So those are the ones that have been investigated now, uh, invested at present to see what their clinical impact is. So if you look at this figure, the number of sequencers, you can see that has been looked at each week in the UK, number of sequencers that have been done, quite a lot. The country with the highest, they have done the most amount of sequencing is in the UK. And you can see as it goes by in the red line, the number of variant, the percentage of those with the variant uh, 
variant structure or, or the, the with the mutation has been rising and that is why a lot of people have got excited and are talking about this variant and the spread about of this variant etc now what do we know about it there were increased cases in the southern and eastern parts of england from the 14th to the 20th of december there were 1100 cases but we have to remember there are approximately 25000 new cases of covid week uh, so we have to remember there are a number of cases in the uk every day and every week so 1100 were uh, the new variant but this variant started way back in september in london and kent mid november to 28% of cases and in mid december it was greater than 60% of cases the dominant variant in the london area so the important thing to remember this variant could have spread there are cases small numbers from Netherlands, Brussels, uh, Australia, there's one case from the UK and other places, even in Iceland. So it has spread. The idea is to try and prevent it spreading further. And that is why a lot of travel bans have come in. And uh, again, the tier four zone came into the, to London, but uh, London and the Southeast, but a lot of people went to other parts of the country. They have detected in Wales and other places, the variant, but not as prominent as in London, but that is being monitored very carefully. So let's go back to the five things we looked at. Spread, severity of disease, diagnostic test, therapeutic the treatment, and the vaccine. What do we know so far? It is supposed to have a significant and substantial increase in transmittability. That is, it can trans up to 70% increase, and a concept called RO is increased by about 0.4, which I won't go into detail, but there is increased. There, at the present moment, there is no evidence for more severe disease. That's an important thing for more hospitalization or that it will adversely affect the vaccine response or treatment and the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine is rolled out in the UK. So at the moment, there's no evidence that is very important or it doesn't cause severe disease, but that is being monitored very carefully and lots of people are looking at it at the present time. So that was a quick run through the new variant of SARS-CoV-2, uh, the number of changes and at the moment, it appears that the transmissibility is increased. Again, there's several studies coming out on that aspect and several lab studies. And the second thing is there's no effect at present on the disease severity, treatment, diagnostics, or in vaccine uh, getting the vaccine response. That is very important. So let us get, next go on to the what are the immune changes that are found in SARS-CoV-2. And these are the changes that I've illustrated here, immunopathology. There is lymphopenia, the lymphocytes decrease, there is T cell activation, another type of, uh, white, uh, type of white cell that gets activated, produces lots of cytokines, there is dysfunction, the lymphocytes don't function properly, there are changes in the other cells and a number of cellular changes give rise to the manifestation of COVID including some uh, stimulation of thrombosis and clotting, which was again an important, so cytokines, clotting. Now a range of medications were used for this, for SARS-CoV-2, but unfortunately, except for dexamethasone, all other medications have generally been not very successful. They have not changed mortality. Dexamethasone did previously, People thought we should not use steroids, but then subsequent study, like the recovery study, found that dexamethasone was beneficial. And the, the, the unfortunate thing is medications have not been very, very useful in this condition. And that is why vaccination comes in quite importantly into the process because we can socially distance, we can isolate, we can wear masks, etc., which is extremely important especially getting rid, yeah, controlling this virus and mitigating the viral effect. But treatment, once a person get has not been really great. And therefore, how do we get the population more immune to the condition? Or how do we protect the more vulnerable groups of the, of the population? 
So if we look at the response, the immune response that you find, you expect antibody response. I said IgG, IgA, IgM. These are, this is how antibody responses occur after SARS-CoV-2. You expect CD4 cells and CD8 cells. And that is, again, you expect those responses to occur following natural infection. And you want to mimic that using a, a vaccine so that you have memory. You have memory B cells, you have memory T cells that get activated if the person sees the virus in the future. So if you can vaccinate the person, get proper antibodies, get proper T cells responses, you'll have that memory and it will get activated and deployed uh, in a situation very, very quickly. The problem is they found that with natural infection, antibody responses seem to wane off after about four to six months. And several studies are going on this, uh, on this uh, uh, aspect. Certain studies show a bigger waning off. Certain studies show, did not show a waning off. But it's an important thing to remember that responses can wane off after natural infection. We are still looking to see what happens after vaccination. Up to three months, we know that the responses have remained stable, but that is an important aspect to consider clinically because do we would we need a second vaccine in a year's time? Would we need another booster? Those are the questions that we'll have to answer as time goes by. So T cell response, I said there's antibodies, B cells, plasma cells, antibodies. So you need memory B cells. Then you have T cell response. Now the T cell response is a very nice paper. People who are unexposed have T cells against corona. That is important because due to cross-reactivity with other viruses, other coronaviruses, they may have these T cells. And they may be protecting people getting the corona infection, coronavirus infection, SARS-CoV-2 in the first instance. That's number one, about 40%. Secondly, once they produce, the patient develops COVID, they produce both a CD4 response, that's a type of T cell, a CD8 response, and it's a against a different range of proteins. It's not on the spike, it's to the membrane, it's a nuclear protein, et cetera. And that is important to remember that it's a multifaceted response and not a single response. You want a polyclonal, you want a multiple response because if there is a variant, especially if there's one variant and one of the antibodies are not working, one of the T cells are not working, still there is the rest of the response that can take over and protect the patient from getting infected uh, with the SARS-CoV. So that's an important, you want multiplicity or polyclonal responses. So that's a quick run through the antibody responses, the cellular responses against different protein. There are about 20 areas of the spike protein that are recognized by the B cells and T cells to produce a response. So one change alone may not be sufficient like the variant to affect vaccine responses. Next, we come on to the another topical topic about COVID-19 vaccines that have been rolled out in a few countries. And uh, anyone who wants to read a bit more, there's an article, there's a review article on COVID-19 vaccine landscape, which can be obtained and read uh, to get more detail. I'll just give a quick run through about the different vaccines. Now, the important thing to remember with vaccines is it can, there are stages of developing any medication, any vaccine, and the, these are the stages, preclinical, phase one, phase two, three, and then the next, next uh, phase, manufacturing phase, and post-approval uh, phase. Now, this process generally takes a long time. 10 years or so has been the average what, uh, uh, time period over the previous years. However, the, the mum's vaccine was about four years. But you know that we produced, the, the, country, the world produced a vaccine in 11 months. Now, the people would say, okay, it was shortcuts taken, etc. No, it was because a lot of these phases took place in parallel, not sequentially. While they were testing the vaccine, developing the vaccine and testing it, the vaccine were being produced, say, in Serum Institute of India. So they were producing the vaccine at the same time that they were assessing to see whether it is effective. Now, you know that the uh, GSK Sanofi vaccine, which they were developing, they did not have sufficient responses. They have developed, they have made so many vials of that vaccine, they had to just bin it because 
that was a gamble they were taking and if it doesn't work then you cannot then you would not use that uh, you, you can't use that so the reason why it got shortened was not because shortcuts were taken but whilst phase 2 was do uh, was going on phase 3 trials were starting at the same time previously you would never have done that process this was a sort of parallel it, it just uh, dovetailed into each other rather than being sequential as in the past because a lot of money was poured in to try and develop because as i told you vaccines appear to be the path that has been taken now if i quickly go through how are vaccines been made so one thing you can take the virus you can inactivate it and it's called the live attenuated vaccine and we have a lot of live attenuated vaccine quite a number of live attenuated vaccine or we can kill the vaccine and inject it and that is called the killed vaccine so you have inactivated vaccine and the live vaccine. That's at the bottom of that uh, bottom of that table. And those are vaccines. How a lot of the standard vaccines are produced. However, new aspects came in. People now you know you have a DNA, you have mRNA, and the protein. So people wondered, can we take the DNA? You have the sequence of the virus. Can we take the DNA and inject it to people? And that is how the DNA vaccine came. And I will talk to you about that. Next, rather than producing the DNA, or can we take the pro, rather than taking the DNA, can we take the mRNA? Because the mRNA in the cell, the DNA becomes mRNA and becomes protein. If you put the mRNA into the cell, could it, then it will produce a protein, the viral proteins. It can't cause the disease because it's only the mRNA of certain proteins, the spike protein or some other protein, at the moment spike protein. So therefore the immune response will get activated. So that is the DNA vaccine, mRNA vaccine. mRNA vaccines are not DNA vaccines. Very important to know that there are differences. Then the next one is, can we take the protein, certain protein subunits, rather than taking the whole virus and inactivate it, because it takes a long time, can we take protein, and that is the subunit vaccine, recombinant protein. Or lastly, can we take parts of the genome of the virus, the, the genetic element, and put it, it, put it with another virus, the adenovirus, which we know can infect the human body, that is the human adenovirus, or the chimpanzee adenovirus. So the Oxford vaccine is taking the chimpanzee adenovirus, which can't infect, which can't cause disease in humans, can't multiply in humans. They take it and put in parts of the corona uh, SARS-CoV-2. So that when it's injected, it would be uh, it would be recognized by the immune response and make an antibody and T cell response. While the JNJ vaccine, the Johnson Johnson and some other the Chinese vaccine has uh, and the Gamalaya vaccine, that's the Russian vaccine, have used the adenovirus, human adenovirus. The problem with that that people wonder is that because patient, people can make antibodies against human adenovirus because it's a common cold virus, they may not be as effective. So the the Oxford vaccine is a chimpanzee adenovirus. You can't; it is doesn't contain any chimpanzee material. It is a chimpanzee virus. So that is a virus can infect it. So that's a very important thing because there is a lot of myths that are going around about vaccination. So there are five different types: the genetic vaccine, that is the DNA and RNA, the subunit vaccine, the recombinant, the subunit vaccine, then the uh, the inactivated vaccine, that's kill vaccine, and the live attenuated vaccine. So of those, the, D, the mRNA vaccines are the ones that have been approved so far, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. And we are awaiting the approval of the, the uh, Oxford vaccine, which is the chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine, which should come to, to, before the end of the year, as everyone is hoping. So this is a schematic to show that the DNA vaccine, you have to give it to using a certain device, and that, again, is a bit of a restriction. Still, a DNA vaccine has not been approved. Inovio is working on it, not been approved. While the mRNA vaccine, it goes into the cell, it is very unstable, so therefore it lasts only a small period of time. It does not integrate into the DNA. That is very important. It doesn't integrate into the cells, the human cells, to the DNA of the human. It does not. The mRNA vaccine does not integrate. So, because that is a that is a sort of a, uh, 
uh, anxiety of different people. It does not integrate. It goes, it is produces a protein, and then it breaks down because it's unstable. That is exactly the reason why you have to use it at minus 70 for the Pfizer vaccine and minus 20 for the Moderna vaccine because otherwise it is unstable. And that is a problem in giving the vaccine out into different parts of the world. And that's why the Oxford vaccine comes in because it's a four degree or the uh, CoronaVac, that's the uh, Chinese vaccine. Again, it's a four degree vaccine. So two types of vaccine, the RNA vaccine and the DNA vaccine. At the moment, it's two RNA vaccines that have been approved. It goes into the cell, produces viral proteins that cannot cause disease and, they have, and then that produce an immune response. The next three are the the non-replicating viruses, the adenoviruses, which come and produce an immune response. Still, the protein subunit vaccines have not been finished their phase the three trials, but that is some area that people are looking very carefully because that did, the people think that that vaccine, a Novomax uh, vaccine, could be an important uh, addition to the armatarium that the people will have. And uh, then you have the live, the kill vaccine, which uh, and the live alternative vaccine people are working. Today, they are expecting the, the news from the CoronaVac, which is the Sinovac, the Chinese vaccine, uh, which has been trialed in Brazil. And the hope is that positive results will come with that vaccine too. So that's an additional armatarium. It's not a uh, uh, it's not an mRNA vaccine. You, this, it's a different type of vaccine, and that is an important uh, aspect to remember. So, what are the vaccines that have entered phase three trials? I told you we have phase one, phase two, phase three trial. The vaccines that have entered phase three trials are these vaccines: the mRNA vaccine, uh, which are the modern and uh, uh, the uh, Pfizer vaccine, which has already been approved uh, in different countries. Then you have the viral vector vaccines, especially the chimpanzee vaccine, which are, they are expecting to be approved in the UK uh, this week uh, or the next week, uh, sorry, protein-based vaccines or the inactivated vaccine or the, uh, and the repurposed BPCG vaccine. These are the different characteristics of the vaccine. I told you, you had the, the Sputnik, the Gamalaya, which is a viral vector, adeno, a human adenovirus vector, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a which is a chimpanzee adenovirus vector and the two RNA vaccines. You can see the difference in temperature for storage. That is why the four to eight degrees is so important for pushing it across to different, different countries. And the cost, you can see the difference in cost. The difference in cost, the AstraZeneca vaccine is the cheapest. And that is why people are putting a lot of hope on that and including the Chinese vaccine, etc. So a number of vaccines are around. At the moment, close to 500,000 doses of uh, the Pfizer vaccine has been given in the UK. A bigger number has been given in, in, uh, uh, in uh, the US, and they have also uh, put out the Moderna vaccine in the US. Uh, they are also using it. It's still not been used in the UK. And uh, the European agency just approved the Pfizer vaccine uh, I think yesterday or day before for use and in a number of different population. We have to remember in the US, 18 million people have had coronavirus. China, in India, 10 million. Brazil, 7 million. UK, 2 million. Europe, a very uh, in, intermediate uh, number. So there are a number of cases, there are a number of variants, and it appears to be with the medications not being effective, People are doing social isolation, et cetera, but some other aspect has to come into the management in addition to bring this under control. Now, the vaccines are being monitored very carefully and allergic manifestations have been reported with the Pfizer vaccine. So far, six times we reported in the US, we have used it a bit more. In the UK, two or three, some, uh, uh, there's a report of another one, but basically two patients. And at the moment, they advise anyone with a history of anaphylaxis to food, vaccine, or medicine should not be given the Pfizer vaccine. Bee sting, yes, you can use it. Uh, and there are some other aspects. A person with latex allergy can use the vaccine, but if you have anaphylaxis, they, have, they would not give the vaccine to that group without waiting for other vaccines to come. On average, the chance of developing anaphylaxis after receiving any vaccine is about 1.31 to a million. So we have special vaccine allergy clinics where 
this is not the only vaccine that has developed uh, allergies. There are other vaccines that developed allergies that this area has been monitored. Lots of studies have been done to see what is the thing that is causing the problem with the vaccine. Polyethylene glycol has been put forward, but not proven. This is found in several vaccines and several household agents. And at the present moment, people who have egg allergy can take the vaccine. People who have fish allergy can take the vaccine. There is no gelatin in the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. There is no squalene in the vaccine. Those are the common questions people ask us when in a clinic. That's why I'm mentioning those. And the patient should be observed for 15 minutes after getting the vaccine. So they, they, uh, they ask some questions from the patient. If you have Ranaflex, you would not be given that vaccine. And we are looking for other vaccines like the Oxford vaccine. Still, we don't know what the till it's approved we don't know the exact uh, information complete bit of information that is an important thing to remember the allergic manifestation so six in the uk and two in uh, six in the us and two in the US. so in this short talk i've quickly spoken to you about the basic aspects of the virus about the different protein the spike protein the membrane protein the envelope protein etc i've spoken to you about the new variant and the change the asparagine to tyrosine change among a number of other changes in the new variant uh, SARS-CoV-2, and that at the moment, it effects seem to be in transmissibility, but not in the other four, severity, diagnostics, treatment, or vaccines, not in those four, but in transmissibility. But things do change, and we have to monitor things as it goes forward. The immune changes, I told you about the change in the lymphocytes and neutrophils, etc. The antibody changes, we had shown some that there is some waning off antibody that's important when the vaccine do we need a second dose can people get reinfected etc the cellular response are important it's not only antibodies you have cell responses so that is important in immune deficient patients etc and then i told you about the covid19 vaccines two vaccines are approved in different in certain countries and have been uh, uh, rolled out Another vaccine should be approved by the end of the year. The Gamalaya vaccine from Russia and the Chinese vaccine are coming into the focus and we'll have a, a group of vaccines that people can be used. When it comes to different countries, what vaccine should be used, that's another lecture, quite a different lecture. I won't go into detail now, but we have to remember the allergic manifestation in the Pfizer vaccine and give you some information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suranjit, uh, for that excellent lecture. I think I am sure that many of us had a lot of uh, doubts about the vaccine currently being uh, talking about. Uh, I'm sure that you have been able to clear the minds of many of us with regard Thank to these. Uh, so I'm sure that you would probably like to uh, take one or two questions if the people are Absolutely. going Absolutely. Yes. Definitely. Definitely, Carol. Yeah, so this one coming. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Suranjit, now uh, you talked about the uh, the ultra quick time in manufacturing this uh, vaccine with compared to the other vaccines, and you actually answered that now how reliable the vaccine could be. But on the other hand, you talk about the immediate reaction to the uh, vaccine, and what about the possible long term effects of? Uh, the vaccines. Do we have to worry about that? Uh, yes. So I think uh, that is, I mean, like any medicine, uh, when it comes into focus, we, we they do studies because some of the trials have been short term. Uh, and uh, again, why the none of the trials, none of the Pfizer trials or the modern trials showed any allergic responses. We had to be, we had to know that. And it's only when you used in people that a few people got allergic response because you're taking from a trial setting, you're taking it to the normal population. Now, uh, when it comes to mRNA vaccine, a, a common question that is asked is what about uh, what about integration? That is long term. Can it integrate in the genome and cause problem? No, it doesn't integrate in the genome. It, when we are talking about the mRNA vaccine, doesn't integrate into the integrate means uh, for some others who want to know integrate means join into the it, it gets in, it gets attached to the genome part of the genome. It does not occur when it comes to mRNA because it produces the protein and then breaks down. Uh, can it produce? Uh, can it produce autoimmunity? Now, we have to remember mRNA vaccines and mRNA diagnostics are not something that came in 2020. 
It has been used, it has been investigated over a period of 10 years. They have been looking at uh, cancer, they have been looking at several other conditions, infectious conditions like Ebola, etc. No vaccine came out from that, but they have investigated quite a lot. Uh, uh, quite a lot of studies have been done and so far the signals for autoimmunity are not coming through. Doesn't mean that, I mean, always in science you have an open mind, right? The pandemic is going at a raging situation. People, millions are dying around the world. Uh, 67, 70 million people have died and treatments are not effective. Uh, social distancing is effective, but how far can you go? Countries, other medical needs are not being met because of the uh, restrictions that are placed and people with cancers, heart disease, non communicable disease are affected. So you have to, what is the balance? Can we get a vaccine to protect the most vulnerable people? Number one, can we get a vaccine to get uh, get uh, herd immunity, which is about 60 to 70 percent of people having immunity, uh, and would that immunity last? So long-term effects, I think the only way we know the long-term effects is by seeing, because that's the same thing with any other vaccine. But the short-term effects, I mean, it was wonderful to see 95 percent, 94 percent with the uh, mRNA vaccine, because I can remember around uh, May, people thought we'll never get a vaccine because HIV, people have been investigating HIV vaccine for years, malaria vaccine for years, dengue vaccine, failure. I mean, generally failure. They're, 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 it has been FDA approved, but uh, overall it has not been a very successful vaccine. So we thought we may not get TB, no proper vaccine. So, but 95%. So that is the thing to bring it under control, the epidemic. Yeah, thank you, Suranjit. There's one question actually came on the chat. Uh, can the vaccine cause an exaggerated immune response when the patients are exposed to COVID-19 uh, virus later? Okay, very good question. And because that, that links up to a common question we ask is, okay, I've had COVID. I know I had COVID. Uh, shall I get the vaccine? Yes, you should get the vaccine. That is the present uh, thinking. If you have, even if you have had COVID, People have gone to ITU with COVID, you get the vaccine. Second, second important thing is, okay, the antibody response, the T-cell response comes. Hey, you, have, hey, you, have two, you have two types of responses. You have the immediate response that is important, but that veins off. And then you have something called the memory response. You have the memory. So the memory response is like our own memory. It remains there. And then suddenly in the future, when you something comes up, the memory gets activated and you want that memory to get activated soon. At the present moment, they are, it, it doesn't appear from the previous studies that were done with the mRNA vaccines, etc., that there is an exaggerated response. But that is something that people would monitor very carefully. That is the memory response should really produce an effector response. Memory effector. Effector is the one that, but you don't want hyper effector response because if there is a hyper effector response, then that has to be damped on. But at the moment, it appears that that is not uh, something that would occur. Yeah, we'll probably wind up with this uh, question, Suranjit. Oh, okay. What is the natural immune response for COVID-19 according to current understanding? Will a patient develop a reinfection after first episode? Yes, another good question. Very good question. So that is why now uh, we know that we are dealing with human beings. We are not dealing with computers. Computers have a zero one base. So it is very easy, and that is an explanation when you deal with patients, which you explain. There is physiology in, a, in your body. There is variation in your body. The immune response you make following corona would be different to the immune response I make and would be different to immune response Mr. Fernando and Mr. Silva make. So it is a different response, but you expect the immune response to be made and for the infection to be controlled. So what is the immune response? Antibodies, white cells, T cells, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells. Now, the how long the immune response lasts varies from purple to per person. 
Now, you know, if you get measles, you expect the immune response to last long term. So you generally don't get people getting second and third and fourth episodes of measles. If you get that, you think that this patient may be having immune deficiency, immune system not working. So the same way with corona, you have the response, but if the response deteriorates very rapidly after four months, after six months, if the antibody response deteriorates, the T cell response deteriorate, that's not the expectation. You want good response. So most people have good response, they don't get infected again. But if their response is waning off, or they are immune deficient and they, are respond, they don't make a good response at the start, then they can definitely get a reinfection. As has been reported in many, many places around the world, it's uncommon, it's not common, but we reinfection has been reported. We have to be careful that the testing is correct because more, uh, quite a few times they found that the testing is wrong and they thought it's reinfection, but it's actually not reinfection. They have to sequence the virus and see that it's another virus. That's an important thing to do. But that is a very good question because like our memory, you know, not everyone in this world will have the same response, antibody and T-cell response. It can't happen. We are human beings. We have physiology. We have differences. So different people have different and like you're treating a patient, not every person will respond the same to the medication. You have different genetic elements that pro, pro, pro predispose you to respond in a different way. So that will be, and reinfection can occur. The hope is that there won't be a reinfection, the two uh, reinfection occurring after the vaccine due to the new variant. That is the hope. Yeah. Thank you, Suranjit. Thank you very much. And we are getting a lot of questions. And uh, okay. I will probably finish uh, with this question, Suranjit, if you bear with me. Okay. Uh, how the Pfizer vaccine effectiveness on new medication, uh, new mutation of COVID-19 circulating in UK? Yes, again, another good or wonderful question. I think this is a very topical area. And there's a, that's a, so, okay, the new variant, I spoke to you about what the new variant is, the important changes, there are about 23 different changes and the important change I spoke to you about. So an antibody could be, would be directed against that part, asparagine to tyrosine, it has changed to tyrosine. So the antibody directed against where the asparagine was there, the N, uh, that antibody would not be effective. Okay. But there are other antibodies. It's not only one antibody that the Pfizer vaccine is making. There are a number of, there are about 20 different parts of the spike protein that T cells and antibodies are made of. So if you're making a monoclonal response, if the vaccine is only producing an antibody against that in uh, to asparagine chain, that, that side, then you're going to have a problem and that is a problem. But the hope is that because it's a polyclonal response, it's a multiple response, that even if that antibody, that specific antibody doesn't work, you have other antibodies which will compensate and still protect the patient. But that is to be seen as we go forward because that's why anyone who gets a vaccine uh, they, if they get corona, they will immediately sequence. And uh, I mean, we have to remember that the UK sequence the highest number of viruses, right? So if you sequence, you're going to find it. It will like testing. If you don't test, you're not going to get positive. If you, if you sequence, you're going to find changes. And they found that this change was one important thing around the world. Once they start testing, you'll, start, you'll find these different variants because it started in September, we have to remember. We start in September, it is not something in December, it has become the dominant uh, area in London. So with regards to Pfizer, you expect multiple antibodies. And as I've listened and read what the, uh, a lot of people who know very much more than me on the Pfizer vaccine say that the hope is that because it's a multiple thing, uh, you will have protection, but that is an open question. We have to monitor it as it goes. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you very Thanks, much. Sir. That was an excellent uh, lecture and uh, what followed after that was again brilliant. And we had a very lively uh, 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 members participating in this uh, meeting. So on behalf of the Gold Medical Association and the new president, Professor Sampath Gunawardhana and his team, I would like to thank you immensely, Suranjit. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much you. for on live. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.